Hello and welcome to another episode of Surviving Constitutional Law. I'm your host, Cameron Shamsabad. In today's episode, we're going to be kicking off our series on Commonwealth legislative power today under the Australian Constitution. So in today's podcast, we're going to be setting up a very basic framework discussing the structure of the Australian Parliament and then uh, the basic framework for the various legislative powers that the Australian Parliament has, which we will build on in successive episodes of this podcast in a more in-depth fashion to discover and discuss the more nuanced aspects of each particular legislative power. So if today we don't go too deep on any particular power that you might be having trouble with, don't worry too much about it. I will be coming to all the important ones for your undergraduate studies and the ones that are really relied upon by the government quite regularly in due course. So today we're going to be going over, very briefly again, the separation of powers doctrine in Australia, and that's going to lead us into a discussion of uh, bicameralism in our legislature, specifically the division between the Senate and the House of Representatives. From that point, I'm going to discuss some of the powers of the Parliament generally, uh, and I'm going to be also making some comparative points to both the UK, Canadian and American systems of government, just to provide you with some full context on the issue. So, sit back, relax, and let's dive into the episode. So first up, why are we starting with the Australian legislature? Well, in order to really contextualise and and put our constitutional law journey on the right track, we're starting with the legislature rather than the executive or the judiciary for a couple of very important reasons. The first is that Chapter 1 of the Commonwealth Constitution creates and empowers the legislature, which means that it's really the first thing that the Constitution sets out. With the executive and the judiciary following in chronology as chapter 2 and chapter 3 respectively. So that means we're really starting where our frame has intended the constitution to start. We're, we're starting our journey from the beginning of the constitution. The second really important reason why we're starting with the legislature is because our system functions in a Westminster fashion largely. And that means that the legislature holds a great deal of influence and predominance over both the executive uh, branch of government due to its history and really a collusive sort of relationship with that branch of government um, in terms of institutional structuring. The third reason, which is very practically speaking, is that each federal law enforced by the executive uh, or heard in dispute by the judiciary must first be created by the legislature. As such, it is really a more practical thing to start with this uh, limb of government rather than any of the other organs uh, of government to consider what the legislature really can and cannot do, um, what can be made into law and what cannot. And if we can set up that basis, we can then discuss the powers of the executive and and the role of the judiciary as well as their powers in a far greater uh, sense. So that's really why we're going to be starting with the legislature today. So I just touched on it very briefly in relationship between the uh, legislature and the executive, how there's that little collusive relationship that's been going on between the two and how it's sort of structured that way within our system. So that really does bring us to the first point that I said we would discuss in our episode today very briefly, which is the separation of powers in Australia. Um, The structure of the constitution separates the various institutions of government into their, into their respective roles. And it's intended to produce a sort of quasi-independence to really varying degrees of each in relation to the other. This is expressed in the Constitution with the establishment of the legislature in Chapter 1, the executive in Chapter 2, and the judiciary in Chapter 3. It's, it's really trying to uh, push the image that these things are separate powers, even if they are exercised by a similar group of people in terms of the legislature and the executive. A simple way to remember the various roles I find in terms of the separation of powers is to think of them in a sort of biological manner. So if you just put it like this, maybe it would make a little bit more sense to you coming to this point of 
uh, your constitutional law journey. The legislature really takes on the role of the brain within the governmental structure. It comes up with the ideas and through making laws it creates orders that are then sent off to be implemented. The executive is the hand or the arms uh, which having been empowered by the legislative brain implements its ideals into the uh, real world and you know push it, pushes uh, the ideas into the society and, and makes them work. The judiciary has a very unique role in the sense that it plays largely the role of a conscience. Its role is to resolve the internal disputes that arise within the government and uh, with people that are interacting with the government and it is a, almost giving a reflection upon the actions of both the legislature and the executive in its decision making. It determines which actions that are taken by the legislature and the executive were right and which ones were wrong and also to what degree in a lot of cases uh, these days. So obviously the, these things are more nuanced than that and um, the judiciary has uh, an ex a more expensive role in terms of state powers and things like that but ultimately as a framework uh, you could think about the separation of powers in that very uh, natural sort of way just to keep uh, a good understanding of things in mind. Now this analogy I found does assist students in grasping the basic roles of the various institutions of government however it really is imperfect for a number of reasons if you apply it in a very in-depth fashion and I would really caution you simultaneously while giving that to you in taking the analogy any further than it needs um, to be taken I, I would stress that it should really be looked at for a basic purpose and that's for two principal reasons the first is that the analogy as I've alluded to isn't exactly right in all cases there are a number of precedents which have proven that the distinctions between the institutions and their powers are somewhat blurred in the case of the legislature and the executive in Australia, the relationship has really no meaningful separation. The collusion here creates a hand that thinks for itself situation, as opposed to a brain, brain hand separation, which the analogy really is meant to give you. The second reason why this is an imperfect uh, explanation is that the government, as created by its constitutional documents, is not ultimately uh, something of physical existence. It is a legal fiction which is maintained uh, generationally without much question. It does not in itself really possess any intrinsic qualities except those which we ascribe to it. So I would really be cautious with the analogy in that sense. However, uh, if you're going to just think about it as uh, what the separation of powers doctrine is meant to be and what the specific roles of each uh, arm of government is meant to be or what organ is meant to be, really that does work for that purpose. But with that firmly clarified and um, set out, I would like to really move on to our Constitution and discuss the Senate and the House of Representatives and their structure, respectively. So let's start with the Australian Senate. Section 1 of the Constitution states, quote, The legislative power of the Commonwealth shall be vested in a federal parliament, which shall consist of the Queen, a Senate, and a House of Representatives, end quote. The Senate in this uh, legislative organization was created as the legislative body intended to represent the state governments as a whole within the Commonwealth. As such, its structure really does reflect the intention of the framers to protect smaller states from those who are larger in population size. As such, each state does have an equal number of senators regardless of population differences. So for example, both New South Wales and Tasmania both currently have 12 senators. Territories are allocated to senators, though this is on a different basis, and as such there are a total of 76 senators currently. The election of senators is to be by whole states voting as one electorate, according to Section 7. However, the Parliament has the power to prescribe the method of election to the Senate, and has done so several times since Federation. Currently, the voting system is by single transferable vote, or STV, which is a form of preferential proportional representation. 
This is quite different from the House of Representatives in some ways, in which each member represents a certain number of constituents within a jurisdictional boundary, which means, naturally, uh, states that have larger populations will have more representatives in the House of Representatives. Just like the House of Representatives, the Senate is presided over by a member. The member who presides over the Senate is referred to as the President, and they must be selected before any other business can be heard by the Senate. The President of the Senate must at all times be a Senator. So now we have our Senate and we've, we've discussed some of the basic structures and some of the basic roles. How do we actually uh, get the Senate in its place? Well, according to the Constitution, anyone who may vote for an election of the House of Representatives is also under Section 8 automatically eligible to vote for Senators. And this means the enfranchisement of people cannot be distinguished between the two legislative bodies. The method of electing senators, as determined by the Commonwealth Parliament, must also be uniform across each state. It cannot be inconsistent from state to state. Now, the powers that the senators, once they're elected, uh, can utilise are considered also co-equal co or coordinate with those of the House of Representatives. It theoretically can initiate laws of any kind for later approval by the House, in the same way that laws can be proposed by the House of Representatives to be approved by the Senate. The only exceptions really come uh, in the form of Section 53, which concern the appropriation of monies for the running of government and the levy levying of taxes. In each case, the Senate is not capable of proposing a uh, law or a bill which would actually uh, do either of those things. Those things must be done by the House of Representatives. It does, however, have the capacity as a Senate to reject all bills, which includes the budget and appropriation bills initiated by the government in the House of Representatives. In relation to the budget, this is called blocking supply. When the Senate fails to approve the budget and blocks supply to the executive government, led by the Prime Minister, this causes a tedious political crisis within the country. If the Prime Minister cannot secure the essential finances to fund the government, under the Westminster tradition, the stalemate is resolved by an election, usually a double dissolution election. As such, in 1975, the Whitlam government was dismissed for this reason by the Governor-General, Sir John Kerr, who exercised his reserve powers of the Queen, and this event when the Labour government was dismissed uh, and a double dissolution election was called is generally considered to be one of the most significant, if not the most significant, constitutional crises that Australia has actually faced in its history. So once we've elected our senators, there is another very important feature of the upper house which should be noted and that is that its members once they're elected have a much longer term than their counterparts in the house of representatives according to section 7 of the constitution senators are to be elected for six-year terms however section 13 does require that every three years half of the senate is subject to an election this is always scheduled to coincide with the general election of the house of representatives so for example absent any double dissolutions the 40 senators that were elected in 2019 will not face another election until 2025. However, those senators who were not up for election in 2019 will face the next election in 2022. Now, Section 15 of the Constitution provides that a casual vacancy of a state senator shall be filled by an appointment of the state parliament. If the previous senator who has left his position or her position was a member of a particular political party, the replacement must come from that same party. However, the state parliament may also choose not to fill the vacancy, in which case section 11 requires the Senate to proceed regardless of the vacancy existing. Should the state parliament be in recess when the vacancy occurs, the Constitution also does provide that the state governor can appoint someone to fill the place until 14 days after the state parliament resumes sitting. 
at which time it's assumed that the state parliament will make an appointment to the vacant position. So with that overview of the Senate in mind and you know having discussed its structure, its powers and aspects of how it's elected, it's important for me to provide you with some context for the Australian Senate and why things are the way they are, looking at the bigger picture. So to figure out why the Australian Senate is really the way that it is, uh, we're going to be looking at two primary examples that our framers would have been considering when they were uh, structuring and debating what the Senate would look like. One of those is the UK House of Lords and the other is the United States Senate. Now in the United Kingdom the Parliament is comprised of two houses. One is the House of Commons which is the lower house and the other is the House of Lords which is the upper house. These two houses however are not equally empowered as with the Australian Senate and House of Representatives. All legislation in the UK by convention should be proposed by the House of Commons and is then subsequently sent to the Lords for either approval or amendment advice. However, since 1949, the Commons is capable of bypassing the House of Lords should they reject a law by simply repassing the exact same law a second time, meaning that the House of Lords can merely delay passage of a law, it cannot completely block the passage of a law. As such, within the UK, it can be stated that the Parliament holds supremacy in the government. However, the House of Commons holds supremacy over the Parliament. In this sense, you can really imagine that the separation of powers there is fundamentally quite different and is comparably extremely disproportionate. Now another aspect in which the House of Lords is extremely different from the Australian Senate is that unlike our relatively small number of Senators, the House of Lords has 785 members. The vast majority of the Lords are appointed by the Queen and are given life peerage, meaning they must never face an election. And of the Lords Temporal, as they are called, the majority are life peers who are appointed by the monarch on the advice of the Prime Minister or on the advice of the House of Lords Appointments Commission. However, they also include some hereditary peers. Prior to 1999, over 100 seats in the House of Lords were hereditary and passed down based upon noble bloodline. Since that time, however, out of about 750 hereditary nobles, only 92 may sit in the House of Lords. These 92 peers must be drawn from the British nobility. 90 of these hereditary seats are subject to a special election, wherein a person of noble birth may be a candidate, and the House of Lords itself, through various and quite unusual mechanisms, may then vote on their peerage. Hereditary peers are elected to hold their seats until their death, resignation or exclusion for non-attendance. In addition to this, there are also 26 seats in the House of Lords reserved specifically for bishops of the Church of England. The Lords Spiritual, as they are referred, hold peerage so long as they are in possession of a diocese within the church structure. Now, to encourage gender equality, female bishops are currently being preferred to males for all new vacancies that may arise until May of the year 2025. And it's likely that this was in response to the disproportionate number of men who have been in the role for such a long time, and given the life tenure, they hold their positions for quite some time. And there's now a um, policy objective or agenda to bring more women into those roles for the next few years so that they will also have life tenure in their positions. Now for us Australians this probably sounds a bit archaic and very silly. Uh, it's very very different from what we would observe within our own country and in most countries around the world. It should be noted that the UK Parliament is really the product of a great deal of historical evolution as I've mentioned in previous episodes. So it's really a remnant from a time gone by uh, 
and it's not built in a modern sense in any way. And really, this has been the perception of people, not just now, this, is, this isn't a, a modern interpretation of things, this is also the interpretation which was being given by a lot of the people who were involved in our uh, federation uh, drafting during the 1890s. Some of them at the federation conventions were seeking to closely replicate the British system as much as possible, probably looking to mimic the Canadian model more than anything else though thankfully the majority preferred to follow the American example structurally much closer rather than either the Canadian or the UK uh, House of Lords. Now in the United States the legislature is divided into two almost equally empowered bodies, these being the House of Representatives and the Senate. This of course is the origin of our own institution's names and the separation of powers really that we do have in Australia. Now the US Senate requires each state to have an equal number of representatives regardless of size. This should really be a bell for what I've already said is the Australian model and you can see the similarities from where we have derived these ideas. As such both Hawaii and California in the United States have only two senators each along with all the other 50 uh, 50 uh, states, they, they all only have two senators. Now originally these senators were selected by the state legislatures, however since the passage of the 17th Amendment in 1913, the appointment of senators by the state legislatures has been replaced and senators are now elected on rotation by their respective states acting as one electorate. Senators are also elected for six-year terms in the United States and the terms are staggered slightly differently from Australia so that approximately one-third of the seats in the Senate are up for election every two years. And this is timed, of course, to coincide with the House of Representatives elections which are held every two years in the US, unlike in Australia where we have a tradition of holding ours every three years. Now, the Senate is... Sorry, the Senate in the US may also introduce a bill on any subject, except those uh, concerning appropriations of money or the levying of taxes, uh, which must originate in the House of Representatives. This should all sound familiar, of course. However, in the US, the Senate also holds a special power to approve the appointment of executive cabinet members and federal judges who are nominated by the President. This is particularly important in relation to the Supreme Court nomination process, where the Senate Judiciary Committee will often spend days questioning nominees as to their constitutional opinions. This should be uh, extremely relevant for you right now, given that we, rec we recently had the uh, passing of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg of the US Supreme Court, meaning there is now a vacancy on their Supreme Court which will be filled by either President Donald Trump if he's re-elected or potentially uh, Vice President Joe Biden if he's elected to the office. The Senate over there will have the final say on whether or not the candidate selected by that person uh, who holds the presidency will actually be successful in making it to the Supreme Court. Now aside from that, the Senate also has the extraordinary power in cases where the President is impeached by the House of Representatives of conducting a final trial of the impeachment. Were the Senate to convict the President of either treason, bribery or other high crimes and misdemeanors, they would be removed from office and later face criminal proceedings against them in a normal court of law. On this basis, the US Constitution actually provides uh, a mechanism for the removal of the head of the executive, the chief executive, uh, in quite unusual fashion, especially compared to, say, Australia or the UK, where ultimately the chief executive being the monarch cannot really be indicted by the crown, as the crown, in all realistic senses, is represented by them. They, they really wear the crown, so they can't be prosecuted. Whereas in the US there is a process of impeachment,
whereby the president can actually be prosecuted. Now, aside from the power of nominee approval and impeachment, the Australian Senate has closely mirrored its American counterpart uh, in a number of ways. It is one example where the uh, constitution of Australia is almost completely devoid of British influence when we look at the Senate, of course. Our framers, particularly Andrew Inglis Clark and Sir Samuel Griffith, favoured the American model over even the Canadian Senate. In Canada, of course, the Senators are appointed by the Governor-General on the Prime Minister's advice, and they hold their seats not for life, but until the age of 75. Now, the primary reason for us supporting the American-style Senate was to entrench the importance of federalism in Australia. The Senate was where populative majorities from large states like New South Wales and Victoria could be tempered by the voice of smaller states like Tasmania and South Australia, who could, by coalitions, prevent the passage of laws privileging the larger states at the cost of those smaller sister states. So with that stated, we now come to the House of Representatives within the Parliament. The lower house of the Australian Legislature, as previously mentioned, is the House of Representatives. It is set out in Chapter 1, Part 3 of the Constitution. According to Section 24, it must be, quote, composed of members directly chosen by the people of the Commonwealth, and the number of such members shall be, as nearly as practicable, twice the number of senators, end quote. Electorates for the House of Representatives are formed on the basis of population quotas, and as such, states like New South Wales and Victoria will naturally have more members in the House than smaller states like Tasmania or WA. Currently, there are 151 seats in the lower house. While there have been attempts to ensure each member represents an almost equal number of people, this has been almost impossible to actually effect. As such, in some electorates and divisions such as, for example, Cowper on the New South Wales north coast, uh, the number of constituents is almost double the number of voters, for example, in Solomon, which is in the Northern Territory. To give you some contrast, in Cowper there's something like 120,000 constituents within that electorate, whereas in Solomon there's something like 62,000. So you can really see in different parts of the country it's just too difficult almost to get it exact. However, this has really raised some eyebrows in the past, specifically because if you have one representative in part of the country for only 62,000 people, and in another part of the country it's almost double that, or potentially more than double that, um, it obviously creates a, an inequality as to the representation because rather than the larger electorate being divided and having two representatives, the smaller electorate in the Northern Territory, for example, gets to keep one uh, representative for a smaller number, which means that its people are naturally a little bit more empowered uh, for their more minority status in that sense. This actually spurred a High Court of Australia case called uh, the Attorney General of the Commonwealth, X. Rel. McKinley and the Commonwealth in 1975. Now, in this case, the High Court was asked to determine whether the disparity that arose within these different uh, electoral boundaries was actually constitutional, given that it does result in inequality between electors. In this case, the court determined that the presence of some disproportionality of population per boundary or electorate is not inconsistent with the Constitution. Chief Justice Barwick actually went further than this, stating that the Constitution should, should be read as an imperial act and that American notions of equality were inappropriate within an Australian context. Justice Mason did, however, state that there are conceivable circumstances where there will be such a large disproportionality that it may produce a question of maldistribution, violating the basic equality of Australian electors. However, within this judgment, uh, Justice Mason didn't really set out what the degree would be to trigger that disproportionality. Would it be, for example, 
60,000 to 120,000 electors in uh, terms of disparity, or would it be, you know, one representative per 100 electors, while in another electorate it is, say, you know, 120,000? The degree of uh, disproportionality isn't really discussed there, but Justice Mason does leave a door open in case the day does actually come when the disproportionality is just too large to ignore. So now we'll move on to the next part of Chapter 1 of the Constitution of Australia, which concerns both Houses of Parliament together. So members of both Houses are required to swear an oath of office according to Section 42 of the Constitution, which affirms their allegiance to Australia and also to its monarch. It should be noted that according to Section 43, a senator or a member of the House of Representatives cannot simultaneously serve as an MP in uh, the respective opposite house. So, for example, a senator cannot simultaneously be an MP in the House of Representatives and vice versa. Now, Section 44 sets out several main grounds for disqualification of parliamentarians. These are, broadly speaking, firstly, being a foreign citizen or dual citizen and therefore holding allegiance to another nation. Secondly, being attained for treason or subject to legal prosecution for either a commonwealth or state offence, carrying a penalty of at least one year imprisonment. Thirdly, being an undischarged bankrupt. Fourthly, holding an office of profit or pension payable by the commonwealth. And finally, having a pecuniary interest in any agreement with the public service of the Commonwealth. So recently there has been a lot of talk about Section 44 due to the large number of politicians that were disqualified uh, from Parliament in 2017. This section, its cases and the wider constitutional debate around it is best really dealt with in a separate episode because there are quite a lot of nuances to this discussion. For now, however, it's enough that we just simply note its existence, but I would say that if you are interested in this topic uh, and the disqualification of politicians and the history of Section 44, you really should look into it a little bit deeper uh, at the moment, and you will find quite a lot of material has been published recently about it. There are some conservative scholars that argue it's working the way it should. Uh, there are also some conservative scholars that are arguing that it's uh, the application by the court is the incorrect part, that the interpretation is incorrect, otherwise the provision would be functioning slightly differently. Um, but you also have some uh, more progressive scholars within the legal sphere who have argued that Section 44 in part or in its entirety should be repealed on the basis that it has an archaic sort of uh, effect, specifically looking at the idea of dual nationality and dual citizenship, which is quite common for a lot of people these days to have both. So if you're interested, this is a very um, good topic to write an essay on or you know, do a short thesis on if you have a, a project upcoming, and there's been a lot of theoretical work done on it as well. So go and have a look at that. But for right now, I won't dive into things too much. I have already digressed quite a bit. So following... Um, through with part four of the Constitution, we do find an interesting provision in section 49 concerning the privileges of Parliament. This section basically states that it is for the Parliament itself to determine its own powers, privileges and immunities. However, until they do so, their privileges shall be the same as those of the UK Parliament. As such, until the Parliamentary Privileges Act of 1987 was passed, the Australian Parliament relied upon the UK Bill of Rights from 1689. So I'm going to provide you with a little bit of history now about that uh, UK Bill of Rights, which will canvas um, the interesting aspect of Section 49. So following the English Civil War and subsequent restoration of Charles II to the throne of England, the Parliament had lost its predominance to the executive arm of government, uh, in the UK. As such, during the reign of his brother, King James II, who is the last Catholic monarch of England, the Parliament invited the support of a Protestant noble uh, 
from the Netherlands to invade with an army of Dutchmen to overthrow King James and place his sister Mary on the throne instead. The Dutch forces were being led by a man named William of Orange, who would co-reign after his successful invasion as King William III of England with his wife, Queen Mary II. James, in turn, had fled to France, where after a failed attempt to reclaim the throne, he lived in exile for the rest of his life. With William's arrival in 1688, however, the English Parliament agreed that, in order to justify the removal of King James II for his tyranny, the Parliament must set out the fundamental rights and privileges that he had abused. This, they believed, would also create a clear line for their new monarchs, which could not be crossed, and if they were crossed, obviously would have some sort of repercussion. This period of time is referred to as the Glorious Revolution in the UK, and it culminated in the creation of the English Bill of Rights, which set out basic civil rights for Englishmen, such as, for example, uh, that excessive bail ought not to be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishment inflicted upon those imprisoned. Also, that fines and for forfeitures before conviction are illegal and void, as well as that subjects have a right to petition government without fear of punishment. Of more concern at the time, and also to the point that is being made now, was that the rights of Parliament were established, and these included, in particular, the right of free speech and debate in Parliament for its members, that only Parliament can levy taxes, that the monarch cannot suspend the laws of Parliament without its consent, and that there cannot be a standing army in times of peace without the Parliament's consent. Now, this statute, along with the Act of Settlement from 1701, among other things, forms the basis of parliamentary sovereignty in the UK, and as such, established the basis of parliamentary privileges. Interference with the exercise of privilege was considered to be a crime, specifically the crime of being in contempt of parliament. So given until the 1980s that the uh, Australian government hadn't adopted its own parliamentary privileges laws, until that time, uh, the UK precedents and laws were really still in place. And as such, not only did the Australian Parliament inherit the privileges of the UK Parliament, but also inherited the uh, crime of being in contempt of Parliament. Now, the interesting part of this story is that two journalists were actually charged with being in contempt of Parliament. In the case of Regina and Richards, ex parte Fitzpatrick and Brown, in the year 1955, which can be found at the 92nd Commonwealth Law Report at page 157, two journalists were arrested for publishing an article in the Bankstown Observer about Labor MP Charles Morgan, who informed the House of Representatives that the article had impugned his honour and questioned his fitness to be in Parliament. Specifically, the article alleged that he had engaged in corrupt legal practice as a lawyer prior to his election. The men who had published this uh, article smearing the MP were brought before the House of Representatives to the dispatch box to answer the charges that they were in contempt of Parliament. Prime Minister Sir Robert Menzies, the much-respected founder of the Liberal Party, moved a motion that the men be imprisoned for 90 days as punishment. It was carried, and they spent three months in prison for the article that they published. The Parliament had found the two men guilty before they even entered the chamber. The only matter to be determined was their sentence. The High Court on Appeal also refused to overturn their punishment, and held that the Australian Parliament retained the privileges and powers of the UK House of Commons and as such, was capable of punishing a person for contempt of Parliament. Since the passage of the 1987 Privileges Act, all charges of contempt are subject to judicial review in a federal court. Section 4 of that Act does provide that certain conduct will be subject to punishment if it, is prob if it properly uh, 
or improperly interferes with the free exercise of the House, its functions or performance of its members. This is punishable under Section 7 with up to six months imprisonment. However, contempt by defamation, which is really what occurred in the Fitzpatrick case, uh, was abolished in the 1987 Privileges Act. Unless, of course, it is said in the presence of a house or committee. So, the moral of the story really is, if you plan on defaming a politician, just make sure it isn't done in Parliament. Now, while the Fitzpatrick case is often overlooked, it is interesting to note not only that speech uh, was punished in that case, and the press censored, but also that the House of Representatives has an ancient power to punish citizens who violate its privileges, exercising an almost quasi-judicial power simultaneously in ascribing both guilt and sentence to the person. The case is also interesting as it was a Labour MP who was allegedly defamed, yet it was perhaps the most famous Liberal Prime Minister of our history who led the House in punishing the perpetrators for their mean words. I shall leave judgment to you as to whether this is a good example of bipartisanship or not. However, it certainly uh, does reveal not only that uh, the Australian Parliament has quite archaic roots in some, uh, in some circumstances, but also that uh, the concept of free speech, expression and protection of the free press is quite different here than it has been in many other free countries. So you should always keep that in mind, that our institutions have been quite abrasive towards the freedom of the citizen. Now with that quite dark story in mind about our history, it's probably now a good time to move into our overview of the legislature's powers. So part five of chapter one sets out the powers of the parliament in making laws. The main body of these are set out in section 51, which contains 39 heads of power under which the federal parliament may legislate. This including quite notably, for example, foreign affairs and interstate trade and commerce matters, external affairs matters, issues of naturalization and also foreign aliens, corporations, and of course, um, particularly in the last couple of years, quite famously, uh, the federal government under Section 51 has the power to regulate marriage. The section also contains lesser known heads of power, though, such as the power of Parliament to legislate in relation to, say, lighthouses, or interstate railway construction, and also the standardization of weights and measures. So if you ever have an issue with the metric system, you should follow it up with your federal MP. It should be noted, however, that these heads of power in Section 51 are not deemed to be exclusive to Commonwealth power. A state government can actually legislate on any of these topics and their laws will be deemed valid unless, of course, an inconsistent Commonwealth law is later made invoking the inconsistency clause set out in section 109. In section 52 there are several subjects which only the Commonwealth Parliament may legislate upon however. These include where the Australian capital city is, regulation of federally owned public places, and also matters relating to any department of the federal public service. Section 54 and 55 respectively also declare that any law seeking to appropriate monies for the public service or levy taxes must be limited in its content solely to the purposes um, of either, either appropriation or taxation. So, for example, a law which would create a new tax cannot simultaneously create regulations of either lighthouses or marriage. It must concern only the subject of taxation. Section 81 of the Constitution uh, treats all money acquired by the Commonwealth as forming one consolidated revenue fund to be appropriated for the purposes of the Commonwealth in the manner imposed by the Constitution. 
Section 83 provides that no money shall be drawn from the Treasury without an appropriation, and that any appropriation must be made by law. That is a law of the Federal Parliament. After a long history of development, uh, the High Court determined in the case of Pape and Commissioner of Taxation in 2009 that neither Section 81 or Section 54 are in themselves sources of substantive power. They are merely corollary controls to the exercise of legislative power. This subject is another which is fascinating uh, in, in the jurisprudence that it has, so we'll return to this in more detail during a later episode, likely uh, not very soon, uh, due to the fact it's not really focused on as much in constitutional law as it's taught in the undergraduate level. However, I would say the constitutional law relating to the finances of government and taxation is extremely fascinating, and there is a great deal of argument to be made that the courts have actually done an extremely poor job in interpreting the Constitution as it relates to financial matters. Now at this point, having set out the structure of the Parliament, it's bicameralism, legislative powers, uh, you're probably expecting things would be wrapped up. However, uh, to end this episode here would really omit a very important aspect of Section 1 of our Constitution, which defines the conferral of legislative power in Australia, namely that the Federal Parliament shall, quote, consist of the Queen, a Senate, and a House of Representatives, end quote. So therefore we must not forget that the Queen, or monarch more generally, is a component also of our legislature as well as our executive branches of government. Unlike in the United States, where the executive and legislative arms of government are separated. In Australia, the two are bound together, taking from the UK and Canadian examples. As such, the Queen, as the de jure head of the executive, and her representative, the Governor-General, hold a special role within the legislative process, one which is almost never recognised due to the limited occasions upon which they are invoked. So according to section 57 of the Constitution, where a disagreement between the Senate and the House of Representatives over a piece of legislation paralyzes the Parliament, such that neither is willing to compromise on amendments to facilitate its passage, the Governor-General may dissolve the Houses of Parliament. This is called a double dissolution, as I've mentioned previously, and has been invoked a number of times in Australian history. Most recently, in 2016, Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull advised the Governor-General that the conditions of Section 57 were met when the Parliament couldn't achieve a consensus relating to amendments of Labor and Union laws. Should this double dissolution not resolve the dispute, the Governor-General can then call a joint sitting of both Houses of Parliament and have the two Houses vote together on the proposal, with an absolute majority being required for its passage. According to Section 58, all laws passed by the Parliament subsequently are to be presented by the uh, Prime Minister to the Governor-General, who acts as a proxy to receive the Queen's assent. They may also, the Governor-General, refuse to assent to a law, instead making recommendations which would be precedent to its later approval. Likewise, the Governor-General may also, in very rare cases, should they choose, uh, refuse signification themselves in deference to the Queen's personal signature. Now, the fact that the Governor-General did give royal assent does not always mean that it will be final. The Queen, according to Section 59, does retain a power to disallow or veto by proclamation any law signed by her representative within one year of it receiving assent. Now, I would note that uh, this hasn't actually been utilised by the Queen at any time of our history, to my knowledge. Section 60 also sets out that a law reserved for the Queen's signification shall not have any force until the Governor-General, by a public speech or address in Parliament or a proclamation, makes it known that the Queen has approved the law. And this must occur within two years of its passage through Parliament, after which it expires and cannot receive assent.
As such, these provisions establish that the monarch, and by extension the executive, has a very strong presence within our legislative process, as all laws require royal approval to be validly enacted. In almost all cases, this means approval by the Governor-General, acting as the Chief Executive. However, it should be noted, consistent with Westminster Conventions, that since the uh, Glorious Revolution, the monarch must only act with the advice of the Prime Minister. This means the Governor-General is appointed on the advice of the Prime Minister, and when in office, by the same convention, is only to act on their advice. The one occasion in which this didn't occur, as previously mentioned, was the 1975 Whitlam dismissal that was deemed a constitutional crisis. So this should give you the impression that by Westminster Convention, therefore, uh, whether it is in Australia, Canada or the UK, the Prime Minister is for most practical purposes during good times the de facto head of both the executive and the legislative branches of government, given that the chief executive in the de jure sense, either the Queen or the Governor-General or both, has to follow their advice. This means the Prime Minister and by extension their selected cabinet ministers are directly responsible for both the creation and enforcement of laws. And that causes a significant centralisation of power within Australia as two of the three arms of government are controlled by the exact same group of people. The advantage which is often cited by those who are politically inclined to this system in particular is that it creates a winner-takes-all system. If you win the general parliamentary election, you automatically control the entire government. This means it is much easier to begin passing laws and implementing your desired policies without any wide uh, checks on power, save maybe in extreme cases for, uh, in, in very limited circumstances as well, for a high, the High Court invalidating a law on constitutional grounds, which in Australia is very, very rare. Otherwise, aside from that uh, very unusual and rare eventuality, you are essentially, if you're elected to be Prime Minister, always guaranteed that a law once passed will receive the royal assent, and it will be enforced by the Executive Cabinet, who are, after all, usually people who drafted or instigated the law, and who the Prime Minister has selected to do so. So we should for a moment consider uh, whether this collusive and more centralised model is really preferable to a strict separation of powers. So in the US, the executive and legislative branches are almost completely separate. The president is elected separately from the Congress, and his cabinet, while requiring the approval of the Senate, are ultimately separate from the Congress as well. The president has no direct hand in the creation of legislation, while his approval is required for a bill to become a law, in similar fashion to our Governor-General giving royal assent, according to Article 1, Section 7, Clause 2, the Congress, in cases where the President does refuse their approval, can actually pass the law a second time, and thereby by bypass his executive veto. So, in cases of a stalemate, the Congress can actually make a law without any executive approval, Unlike, for example, in Australia, where if the monarch theoretically didn't give their approval, uh, the law simply couldn't be passed. Now, one occasion that this happened in the US was the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which sought to ensure equality and citizenship for all people born in the US regardless of race or colour. This was vetoed by President Andrew Johnson. Congress subsequently overrode his veto, and it was made a law without a presidential signature. For context, most, the most vetoes ever uh, given by a sitting U.S. president was by uh, Democratic President Franklin D. Roosevelt during the Second World War, who vetoed a staggering 635 bills. In more modern times, uh, things have been much more resigned, in the sense that President Bush and Obama both vetoed 12 laws each during their eight years, and President Trump has only vetoed eight so far in his first term. Now, in around 10% of regular veto cases throughout US history, uh, the Congress has overridden them by passing the law a second time. 
So really, the laws which end up getting vetoed are, and, and obviously not overturned, are the ones which are a little bit on the fence, the ones where the Congress only has a slight majority, and taking it a second time through the legislative process is either too time-consuming or simply too difficult. As such, uh, the US system does provide a mechanism by which Congress can actually bypass the President in cases of a severe stalemate. Um, and this is to be contrasted, for example, with Australia, where if for some reason the Governor General uh, didn't want to sign something, they would either have to be replaced or the law would simply just not happen. Now, of course, in practical terms, that would never happen in Australia because according to the conventions I mentioned, uh, the Governor General is just meant to um, act on the Prime Minister's advice and the Prime Minister would almost certainly always advise to sign the law. So we're talking about apples and oranges, but in terms of checks and balances, uh, the US system does provide that separation with a check and a balance in place to make sure that just because the President says no doesn't mean that something won't happen. Now, there are also circumstances in the US where a president may decline to enforce a law. While the take care clause of the US Constitution, which can be found at Article 2, Section 3, Clause 5, does require the president to execute the law even if he disagrees personally with it, if a president does believe that the law is unconstitutional, they as the chief executive can choose not to enforce it. The dispute, usually resolved uh, by the judicial branch, requires um, the Supreme Court to determine which side is correct. And in the Supreme Court case of Freytag and Commissioner, uh, set out at volume 501 of the United States Reports, found at page 868 uh, from the year 1991, of course, uh, all four of the justices of the Supreme Court who addressed the issue as to whether or not the president can simply not enforce a law that he deems unconstitutional, uh, agreed that the President has, quote, the power to veto encroaching laws, or even to disregard them when they are unconstitutional, end quote. And the reason why is because in the United States there is a belief that the President, as well as the legislature and the judiciary, has a solemn responsibility to enforce the U.S. Constitution. So in cases where the president believes that the legislature is doing something unconstitutional, it, uh, the office requires the president to actually act uh, on, that, on that opinion and do what they think is their constitutional duty, which would be to not enforce that law. Naturally, uh, this is dramatic and it always ends up in uh, some kind of dispute within the courts or some sort of political accommodation being uh, made. Uh, though it is a possibility for that to occur. Conversely, also, in cases uh, where the laws of Congress are valid, so they are constitutional, but they do unjustly criminalise someone, uh, the President may also pardon uh, the person who's been criminalised under Article 2, Section 2, Clause 1. And examples of presidential pardons coming to the rescue can be seen all throughout uh, the history of the US, and they really do go all the way back to the time of the framers. Uh, specifically, uh, during the founding generation, uh, President John Adams created a series of laws which criminalized criticism of the US government, in particular, uh, the Sedition Act of 1798. Now, many people were fined and imprisoned under this law for seditious speech by speaking against his administration. The law was actually never tested in the Supreme Court uh, as to its constitutionality, and thankfully so. Uh, yet the incoming president, Thomas Jefferson, regarded it himself as unconstitutional. Because of this, he decided to utilise his presidential power, and he pardoned, commuted, or rescinded the convictions of over 119 people who had been punished under the Act. In doing so, he had protected the First Amendment rights of a number of Americans and fundamentally, uh, through his example and subsequent repeal of the Sedition Act, uh, revealed that he was in favour of the freedom of Americans under the US Constitution as opposed to uh, their prosecution for exercising that freedom. The example which was set by this 
has been followed throughout uh, US history. And quite recently, uh, President Trump se- uh, had the sentence of Alice Johnson commuted in 29- 2018. Sorry. Now, Alice Johnson had been convicted of a first-time drug offence in 1996 and was sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. Since her pardon in 2018, she has become an activist for criminal justice reform, particularly to end mandatory sentencing and the drug war. By now you can probably see the important differences between the two systems of government. While in Australia and parliamentary democracies like the UK and Canada, uh, there is a winner-takes-all approach. The United States, by its divisions of power, has a much more gridlocked system by design. This makes lawmaking and enforcement much more difficult, while the parliamentary countries seek to streamline the lawmaking process, the United States seeks to frustrate it and uh, make it much more difficult so that you have ultimately less laws. Uh, The reason for the difference is really quite ideologically rooted. While in parliamentary countries the focus has been on the effective exercise of political power, the United States Constitution, by its very design, is focused on the limitation of political power to reserve the rights of citizens. Whether you prefer one or the other will really depend upon your ideas on political theory. Ultimately, though, this is an example where political ideology will intersect with constitutional law, and your opinions, one way or the other, will be informed based upon your political ideals. So to recap on what we have covered today in our episode, we have gone over the constitutional basis for the Commonwealth Parliament and its legislative powers. I discussed the Senate, its role within our bicameral system, and also its historical predecessors, as well as the House of Representatives and its role, its important role within our and other parliamentary democracies. Aside from the structural facts, I also gave you a brief overview of the powers of the Commonwealth Legislature and also how the monarch and her representative fit into the legislative process. To wrap up, I then contrasted our Westminster parliamentary model with the United States Republican system, just to give you something to think about going forward in terms of the wider context of constitutional theory. While we covered quite a lot today in terms of uh, content, it should also be noted that it is rare in law school that you would get any sort of explanation on this sort of topic, um, given prior to jumping into the more substantive aspects of legislative power. No one really does sit you down and explain, uh, sit down with you and explain the uh, structure and uh, reasons behind the formation of government. They really just dive straight into the Section 51 stuff. So my hope is that the explanation I've given in today's episode will make some of those upcoming topics within the legislative powers Um, subject easier to understand and perhaps has given you a bit more context to think about them in. So from our next episode we're going to start discussing some of the key uh, legislative powers of the Commonwealth in more detail and that's really going to take us over the next three or four episodes I would say talking about some of the main legislative powers that the Commonwealth relies upon and also the ones that you study in law school. In particular, on our next episode, we're going to be covering the trade and commerce power, which is found in section 51, subsection 1. So, I hope you enjoyed today's commencement on Commonwealth legislative powers, and I hope you're prepared for our next few episodes. Please stay tuned for our next one on trade and commerce power. And until then, of course, please remember to always keep reading.